My name is Walter Mattuck. Ever since I was a young boy growing up, I love trains. With railroad tracks nearby, I watch passenger and freight trains going by my house every day. Around the family Christmas tree was a Lionel train set. Getting married and having two daughters, I look for ways to expand my railroad interest and also include my family to give my daughters a unique educational experience. Well, about 10 years ago, I discovered railroad motor cars. Since then, we've traveled thousands of miles on our restored motor car, met many new friends, visited interesting cities and towns throughout the United States and Canada, saw spectacular scenery, including animals in their natural habitat, like bald eagles in West Virginia and big moose up in Canada. We rode on tracks that hadn't seen passenger trains in years and enjoyed every minute and mile of it. So sit back, climb aboard, join with us as we go to the wilderness by motor car. What is a railroad motor car? No, it isn't a locomotive or a train, although it does have wheels, lights, and carries railroad workers. But let's start in the beginning. As America's railroads expanded in the period after the Civil War, the additional track and more trains required a safe system of track inspection. Since it was not practical to run a full-size train to inspect and perform minor repairs, Usually one man would go out and inspect the various track work, telegraph poles, and signals. Sections of track about three or four miles in length were assigned to a railway man who walked up and down the tracks in his section each day, looking for loose bolts, missing spikes, and anything that would be dangerous to the trains. To increase his mobility, a hand push car was designed to allow him to have tools and inspect at the same time. Special trackside platforms, called set-offs, allowed him to remove his push car off the rails and allow trains to pass him safely. This first hand car was propelled along the track by men walking beside the car or shoving poles against the end of the track ties while standing or sitting on the car. The next development saw this hand car equipped with a crank mechanism that allowed the man to turn on the handle, thereby causing the gears to turn the wheels. This method was further improved by the installation of an upright walking beam handle that allowed two men to pump up and down, directly sending their efforts to a set of gears attached to each wheeled axle. Working in unison, up to four men could propel the hand car down the tracks and depending upon the amount of men in the gangs, even haul a trailer with more men and supplies. However, this hand car was not without drawbacks. The main reason was that after pumping the cars to the work site, the men were too tired from pumping to effectively get the repair work done. In the early 1900s, the railroad management began to experiment with adding engines to these pump cars. Now, the work crew could arrive at the work site quicker and have more energy available and even inspect longer track sections. Even better, the pump cars could be adapted to accept engines without much additional expense. However, out of necessity, motor cars that allowed even more improvements were soon being made by outside companies, especially for the railroads. With names like Kalamazoo, Buda, Sheffield, Northwestern, to name a few early pioneers, these motor cars allowed the railroads greater flexibility and mobility for maintenance and repair of the railroad property. Today, most railroads have discontinued using motor cars they have been replaced by newer highway trucks with small railroad wheels attached. Driving over highways to the nearest railroad track has made the motor car obsolete. Obsolete, yes, but not forgotten. It seems that a small group of dedicated individuals managed to acquire surplus railroad motor cars as they were retired. They were able to secure permission from some museums to run their motor cars on short sections of railroad trackage. But this was not enough. Other people soon found out about this interesting hobby, and an organization called NARCOA, 
The North American Rail Car Operators Association was formed in 1987. With over 500 members throughout the world, NARCOA organizes trips on real operating railroads during the year. As their reputation for safety and responsibility grew, the tracks of some of America's and Canada's largest railroad companies have become available to motor car hobbyists. The South Branch Valley Railroad is one of the oldest established motor car meets in the United States. Participation now has grown to at least 50 motor cars from throughout the country run this railroad every summer. If you don't have a motor car, you can take the scenic train which runs the trough of the South Branch Valley of the Potomac River. Motor carring is unique. You don't know what to expect around the next corner or the next curve. Some of the more enthusiastic motor car participants have taken automobiles and adapted them to the tracks. And that's how they do it. In West Virginia, we went down to the town of Spruce, which is the home of the Cass Scenic Railroad, a former logging railroad that has now been refurbished and restored to operation by the state of West Virginia. The Cass Railroad is unique in that it utilizes geared Shea steam locomotives to power their trains. The reason for these locomotives is the unique tractive effort that is needed to push and pull the cars up the grades to the top of Bald Knob. The mill at Cass is a reminder of the heyday of the lumber and timber interests that made West Virginia. Ever wonder how we get the motor cars to the railroad? Well, this is one way. You've got a trailer and a group of friends who are willing to help.
And here we are at Belfont Station. We're awaiting the beginning of the Narcoa Motor Car Meet. The endless mountains of Pennsylvania host another motor car adventure. along the former Pennsylvania Railroad line that ran from Altoona down to State College, these signals stand as silent sentinels and a reminder of the glory days of American railroading. Fall foliage in Bucks County, Pennsylvania is also a welcome sight from the motor car. Reminders of their days of former glory, these passenger cars used to be part of name trains like the Queen of the Valley and the Wall Street and the Crusader. Now they sit waiting for the next final trip to the junkyard. In the quaint village of New Hope, we took some time off to go for a mule barge ride along the restored section of the Delaware Canal. Not as fast as a motor car, but equally unique. Now we see how we're turning the cars. This is an M19. The only problem is you have to make sure on a dirt crossing like this that you don't go over the outside of the rail with the front because then it makes it harder to lift. You're pivoting on the front and you're raising from the back. Up in Canada, we experienced many welcome miles as the guests of the Canadian National, Canadian Pacific, Ontario Northland, and Algoma Central. Even though we're on the tracks, the railroad motor cars do not have the right of way at automobile crossings and we have to stop and flag the busier crossings. Just like the railroads, the motor cars go through the backyard of these little villages and towns. Silent reminders of the glory days of steam railroading, like the base of this water tower, can be stopped and inspected at our leisure.
An interesting part of motor carring is coming up to a tunnel. You don't know what's inside, and the eerie darkness just beckons you to find out. Ever wonder why one of the nicknames for the motor car is a putt-putt? Here we have a selection of bridges from covered bridge on the road to two different types of railroad bridges. We've got gasoline-powered motor cars and we've even got steam-powered motor cars. mountains of Tennessee, we're now along the Natalana Gorge. The base of the gorge, where there's a little outcropping and overlook. See the rafters. The high point of the trip, the bridge over the end of the Natalana Gorge. of pulpwood for the paper mills of northern Canada.
Some cars are open, some cars are partially enclosed, and other cars don't even have a windshield. They're affectionately known as the bug-eating cars. The reason being is that's what the motor car operator winds up doing for most of the run. Most of your motor cars weigh at least a thousand pounds. With the extra equipment and with the larger cars, they can equal close to 15 to 1600 pounds. The belt driven cars need to be crank started just like those old antique automobiles. Retarding the spark and adjusting the fuel mixture allows the engine to get to life. Very few towns are encountered when you're going on a motor car trip up in Canada. Everybody has to be prepared for all types of weather. We've been up in Canada in June and ran into a blizzard. And then two days later, it was 90 degrees. On this trip, we were out for three days. Each night, the railroad had a place for us to store our motor cars, and we went to a local motel for the night. operated around passenger trains and freight trains, always under the watchful escort of our railroad guides. From high-speed mainline to a lowly branch in Pennsylvania, that hasn't seen a train, never mind a passenger train, in 15 years. Even some of the highway crossings have been paved over and this is the only way to get across. You have to feel and think where the tracks would be and hopefully wind up in line with the rails on the opposite side. 
yes it really looks like mother nature is trying to take over the tracks in some places you couldn't even see the rails which meant extra diligence and safety at all times In addition to having paved highway crossings, sometimes because of rain, the dirt has actually washed down over the tracks and we had to clear the right of way to get the motor cars through. When we started, this area of tracks for about 30 feet was entirely covered by dirt and gravel. It took at least 45 minutes of hard work by everybody concerned to get just the minimum amount of clearance to get the motor cars through. And it still wasn't enough sometimes. The center section of the dirt is still high enough to catch the motor car. Clear a little bit more of the rocks and gravel and maybe we can lift it from the other side. This is a former Canadian National motor car that was purchased at a railway surplus sale, brought back into the United States, and is now painted and restored as a Lehigh Valley motor car. and they're free. No need for a hood ornament anymore. On this particular trip, the further we went, the worse the track got. Looks like John hit a tree. Kill the tree too. Pull the handle through. And pull the front of the car that way. Motor carring is a hobby that you enjoy in all types of weather. Rain, snow, sleet, hot sun. If there's rails, there's always somebody ready to ride them. Of course, the number one rule of motor carring is riding with permission of the railroad or company involved. As the hobby of motor carring gets more known by the participating members and the railroads, more trackage has been opened up to the motor car enthusiast. Looking at the abandoned structures, one only wonders how many thousands of people and thousands of pounds of freight were transported by the railroads at the location.
A lot of unique ways to get the cars off the trailers. Sheffield Fairbanks Morse 40B. Probably one of the oldest cars on the run today. to start the run and the motor cars slowly make their way out from the railroad shop facility at Moorfield around the Y to where we join the main. Motor car trips are usually run in sections meaning start in the morning run till about lunchtime take a break and possibly run a different section of the railroad. That way it breaks up the day makes it more restful and enjoyable for all those who participate. On the larger runs, the railroad usually has a vehicle on the front and the rear of the motor car caravan in constant communication with the railroad dispatcher via mobile radio. Even though the highway crossings are protected by automatic signals and other safety features, railroad motor cars do not activate the circuits because they are electrically insulated. So each major crossing has to be manually flagged and the traffic stopped before the motor cars go over. like for the pioneers going across America in the mid-1800s, vast expanses of farmland and cattle land lay alongside the railroad tracks. Nothing much has changed in over a hundred years. In the late 1960s, the New York Susquehanna and Western Railroad, a New Jersey short line, abandoned most of its service west of Butler up to Sparta Junction. In the next 25 years, the trackage was reclaimed by the forest. Starting in the late 1970s, members of NARCOA volunteered their services to the railroad to clean the brush and trees from the tracks. All this work culminated in early 1990 when the Susquehanna Railroad hosted the first ever motor car trip over the completely renewed and vitalized trackage over Sparta Mountain.
I guess after this, one understands why most vehicles nowadays have power steering. clearing to get down to the absolute positive end of track. Some people are determined to get every last foot of trackage. This is the actual diamond from Sparta Junction. What's that little house back there? Foreman's office back there. Only, you, can go, you can only get in there by, appoint, by appointment. Do a lot of business in there, huh? Lots of business there. Lots of investigations in there, huh? What's the reason for taking up the siding here? Uh, the, no more siding here because it's no longer required and they sold all the steel to a different company. I don't know exactly what company bought the rail. We're going to be picking up all the steel, the leftover ties and the plate is going to go up to a track up in Kid. The owner uh, is going to put in two tracks up in Kid. Uh -huh. so we'll be going up there in a, few, a couple of weeks. The steel game is going up there to put this track in. We're going to load a thousand ties in a bulkhead flat. They're down there in the yard. And we're going to load two switch sets and we're going to be taking that up there also. <laughs>
On most of our trips to Canada, the journey takes us through areas where there are no roads, no interstate highways, no airports, just the railroad. The only way to get to a lot of the towns and small settlements is by a real train. And some of these trains just travel once or twice a week. To get on board the train, the local residents just walk to the side of the track and flag down the train. It's their only way in, their only way out. Now we're setting the wheels on the track and locking them in place. Through rock cuts that you can almost reach out and touch. Through dense forests. alongside magnificent lakes. The Canadian wilderness, accessible only by rail. The towns and settlements were built alongside the railroad tracks with the siding to get the freight cars, hauling supplies. The stations became the focal point of the town. On a trip to Agawa Canyon in northern Ontario, our motor car expedition goes over the 200-foot high bridge at the Montreal River Electric Hydropower Plant, which supplies the city of Montreal. Coming into Ogawa Canyon in northern Ontario, the rails hug the tracks on one side as the river takes up most of the room to the other side. Ogawa Canyon is the highlight of a passenger train run that goes from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario up to Ogawa Canyon every day on the Algoma Central Railroad. We're down in Virginia at Fort Eustis as the United States Army hosts a motor car meet on the Fort Eustis Military Railroad. It's said that someplace in the United States, every weekend, there's a motor car trip.
a surprise around every curve. A motor car operator has to be vigilant because the cows don't know the right of way. They think this is their railroad. No, this has nothing to do with trains or motor cars or railroads. This is history. We're at Gettysburg, the site of the most decisive battle of the Civil War, where brother fought brother. In 1985, the south branch of the Potomac River was at flood stage and actually washed away this bridge and about five miles of railroad as it came through the gorge. It has since been replaced and it's a magnificent aspect of our yearly trip on the South Branch Valley Railroad. Seeing the bald eagles nesting along the south branch of the Potomac is another highlight of this yearly trip. These bald eagles are at home in their natural habitat, disturbed only by the twice a day passing of the freight train and today with the motor car. Catskill Mountain region of New York plays host to a annual motor car ride. It has been said that among all of man's inventions, the steam locomotive is the only invention ever made that truly has a heart and soul. Looking at these magnificent steam locomotives, they seem alive with smoke and steam and huffing and chuffing. Each locomotive takes on a characteristic of a real human being. Now we're lined up for the runaround.
carring allows us to experience railroading, a railroading that most people think has vanished from America, but not when you take the motor car. Motor carring lets you get real close to real railroading.